Hi everyone and welcome to the Blavatnik School of Government and we're very glad to be launching today the book of uh, one of our professors, uh, Professor Stefan Durkan. Um, the book you can see here um, and will be on sale outside as well. It's called Gambling on Development, Why Some Countries Win and Others Lose. So my name is Kate Orkin. I'm on the faculty here at the school, a development economist and also one of Stefan's students. Um, as many of those of uh, you in the room are as well. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be to be doing this. The tables have turned. Um, so I'm very glad to be asking the tough questions today. So Stefan is a professor of economic policy at BSG um, and the economics department. He's also the director of the Center for Study of African Economies. Uh, for the last many years, he's combined his academic career with work as a policy advisor. So between 2011 and 2017, he was chief economist at the Department of International Development. Um, and until uh, since 2020 and until very recently, he's been the development policy advisor to a succession of foreign secretaries at the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. His research interests um, are, are broad ranging, but focus really on what keeps some people and countries poor and you know, the, we always call him the most optimistic cynic we know, um, thinking very importantly about how to achieve change. And his latest book um, is going to draw on his academic research as well as his policy experience across three decades, 40 odd countries, um, thinking about why some countries have managed to settle on development bargains um, or elite bargains that favor growth and development and others haven't. His work has been called many things, He's been called provocative. <laughs> He's been called a maverick. <laughs> but I think one of the things I loved about this book, uh, he said to me when I first started as a master's student many years ago, he said, all you have to do is report the world as it is, not as you want, not as your theory wants it to be. And I think that's what's very exciting, potentially groundbreaking about this book is that it's, it's making us rethink some of our assumptions about how um, development ought to be done based on what's actually going on in the places where it's practiced. So without any further ado, uh, welcome to Stefan, but it would be great if you could give us a bit of an introduction to what you're trying to say. Well, well, well thank you, Kate, for these uh, very generous words. Um, so let me actually tell, start with a story. And it's actually um, a story uh, of partly based on my experience working in different countries. And just imagine, as I was about seven, eight years ago, I was invited to the Prime Minister's office in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And they were going to discuss, and I was the chief economist of DIFT at the time, they were going to discuss their ambitious plans for development in the DRC. And so we were brought in into the room. Um, and basically for three, four hours, I was surrounded by about 20 to 30 very sharp suited men, I'm afraid they're all men, uh, giving uh, an incredibly clear and actually quite exciting vision of what the DRC was going to look like and what they were actually going to do. We had perfect plans, actually, textbook plans almost, you know, the World Bank would have been proud of it, but actually thinking, look, this is quite interesting what we have. And I remember listening to them and all very politely and asking questions, and they were all very excited in doing this. And I remember walking out and I remember telling to a colleague, it's quite amazing, isn't it? We've seen some theater here. This is all fiction. Uh, because I bet in five years, nothing will have happened. With this. Now contrast, a few months later, I sat in Ethiopia on a small retreat with some senior officials actually at the level of ministers, advisors to the prime ministers, far fewer people. And they were telling us the kind of plans they were making for the next phase of development. We're talking again, seven, eight years ago, conflict was far away, whatever. I was sitting in the room and we were listening to them. And I remember thinking, no, the economics didn't quite work. This is not at all perfect. This is actually hmm, quite a risky thing to do it like this. But I also knew perfectly well they're going to do it, and it's actually going to be quite successful. And it's actually that, that a little bit trying to articulate why is it that in some places, you know, very little happens despite the best plans and recipes, and in other places, 
actually, you know, quite a lot is happening. And I think as an academic, having studied always what should be done and what has to be done, but actually we confront the reality, you have to really start asking much more about, you know, how comes that in some places they get it done? And why is it actually happening? And this is a bit what the book is trying to get at. And, you know, the, I think the, the most important thing, I think, is, well, it's probably three things. Here. Let me say the first one is that there is no such a thing as a perfect recipe. There's no such a thing as the silver bullet for development, for growth, or for progress in economies in, in very poor countries. Actually, the things that need to be done, they're not rocket science. If they're not happening, it's not because the leaders are so ignorant, the technocrats are useless or whatever. It's actually something else, and that's actually the second point, is that what I think I've learned working much more in practice, also as a kind of a technical person, as an economist, is that you know, what happens so much depends on what's happening in the country with those that can make it happen, those with power and influence, which I call the elite, and basically the nature of the elite bargain they have in these societies. You know, and I'm not talking about just the politicians, it's also the military, the people in business, maybe the civil society, even people in the universities. How, what kind of deal they have under, amongst each other in terms of what they're actually shaping, how they're shaping that society. And so fundamentally, we come to the kind of idea of, you know, how to get development. Well, you probably need somehow, so countries that are successful, to have some way or another managed amongst their elite to get an elite bargain for development and for growth. Basically, what I call a development bargain, and trying to understand, you know, um, where this is present, how this comes about, and so on. And I think that's partly what the book is about. And when you start looking at it with that lens, which that fundamentally say, well, what are the kind of features of that the, the development bargain? It's probably three things. It's first fundamentally a shared commitment, at the least for peace and stability but probably also for wanting to really make a success of the country. And then secondly, the state, don't use that just as a resource that you're trying to, you know, just use to line the pockets of those in power and whatever, but actually use it reasonably well within your capabilities to do it. It doesn't have to be the perfect institution. It doesn't have to be the perfect centralized state, whatever, but something that's been going on. And then finally, probably importantly, a fundamental willingness to learn within the system, because we don't really know how to get development exactly. We know the ingredients, but actually for every context, you have to find the kind of path that actually begins to work and hopefully do reasonable things, get your technocrats to learn and assess how well it's going and then to progress within it. And that actually leads to kind of, for me, quite an optimistic vision of what's going on in the world. You know, there's some people say, oh, we have to have perfect institutions and we'll have to start looking like Britain uh, before we can do development. Uh, you need to have perfection first. And if you don't have it, well, the only advice I can give you is like, sorry, you had the wrong history and this is where you are. Or other people say, you know, you have to have the perfect, all the perfect things that need to be, be aligned. No, no, the societies that make progress in recent times are quite diverse. And then you start looking at it and okay, you see China, but they do it in a particular way. But I think the fundamental lesson of China is that in 1979, Actually, you started getting, look, we're going to look for legitimacy in our politics to development, through growth and development. But otherwise, I don't think there's that much to learn from China for other countries, because we actually have success stories. I would say Bangladesh is a success story. Actually, quite a messy state, not a very, you know, quite corrupt and really not functioning that well. But actually, if you look at the indicators, they've done really well in recent times, you know, 15, 20 years of 5 6% growth. Poverty reduction unseen, girls' empowerment at levels unseen in uh, a Muslim country uh, where girls performing better in education and health that many other countries should be really jealous of, and so on. So you get this kind of progress. You go to Ghana, where actually you say, well, that's actually quite a success story since the 1990s. You know, they've gone, come a long way. And you go across Africa and say, well, actually, I begin to see it maybe even a bit of it in Kenya. And Ethiopia had it, yes, they gambled and they didn't get the cover. So let me stop now in the introduction. But basically, I want to tell a positive story, an optimistic story as well. That actually, this is not about seeking perfection, but within states, elite bargains can be found that actually are favorable for development bit by bit and so on. 
what it means for us, well, I write in the book a little bit about what we can do. I find very hard to as a white male sitting in London in Oxford to tell them this is how you should be doing. So I'm a bit more cautious of how to give the advice to get there. But the minimal amount is, is that if you want to make a difference, try to understand what is actually happening in that country. What is actually the nature of the elite, the elite bargain, the politics of the place, and understand that. And with that in mind, if you want to assist or give advice, just try to think of it. How will this work through in this society if I start doing this? Is this the right next step, the thing that we should be pushing and so on? So why don't I stop here and let Kate grill me first. <laughs> um, so, so how are we going to run this? I'll do a couple of questions to start. Um, Jamie, I think if you could put the, um, the Slido slide up for us. So because we've got people both on a, a bunch online and in person, um, we have a, a technology called Slido. So that's going to come up uh, shortly. Um, and we're, there's a website that you go to and you just click in a little uh, number. Um, so you, you click in this, this number um, and then you can key in a question. And as those start coming in, we'll see people upvoting those. Um, and then I have the power, so I will decide whether uh, which questions we we ask or not. Um, but you can uh, we, you can upvote other people's questions as well, the ones that you want to want to ask. But I'll take the chair's prerogative um, to start with a couple of of questions. So the first, I mean, those of you who haven't been on Twitter this week have been missing some serious barnstorming, some great cat photos. Um, but Stefan's been talking quite a bit about the the book. And I think you talk a lot in some of your tweets about the importance of integrity as a political entrepreneur, so actually believing in something. And it strikes me that in many of the countries that you, you talk about, these ideology, these narratives, so you know, what the governing elite actually believes in is very important. And so I, you know, if you think of China, Ethiopia, Ghana, you don't talk about South Africa, but you know, the ideology does play an important role. Does it matter at all what the political elite believes, like what the ideology is, or is it just that there's something cohesive that's there? Well, I think I think it's 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 quite a it is more than that. Okay, so it it can't just be about words. You know, I've I've heard enough people, and in fact, the Congolese example is one where they can tell me all kinds of plans that they have. Um, you know, there has to be a credibility around it, and actually. You know, when, you, when the narratives and, the, and, and, and the, the, the stories they tell about what they want to achieve, the, the proof is really in the pudding. It's basically, you know, you want to actually ask yourself how they are trying to see this through. So, so how the narrative is spun within the own context can be at times be less important. Um, and in other times it can be really important. You know, you could have, you could have, for example, a national narrative that you want to tell that actually is quite important, but it's done what's underlying it. So it's not simply about the big, the big statements that we make, but it's actually how are they actually trying to underbuild this? And so I alluded to it as well, you know, a commitment has to be credible. You know, I talk a lot in the book about the shared commitment to growth and development, but the credibility of it has to be really very uh, important. And this is where that, that final thing, I think, that, that I really want to emphasize and also talk about in the book, and then those who know the work by Yan Yan Ang may have picked it up, how she talks about China as well, is to actually having a form of governance and accountability within your own system, however it works, that actually keeps you to trying to actually do better in the narrative you have. You know, it could be in Ghana, Actually, they've probably found it within electoral politics. They found since the 90s a form of electoral politics that is acceptable, where people, where politics is increasingly based on results and outcomes. But actually, you have regular changes of power that, broadly speaking, are accepted by the political elite. While in China, of course, it is within a one party state and with all kinds of features. And if there is an accountability, definitely in the, in the 80s and the 90s, it was around within the party. Are we performing on the basis of what we're saying we want to do on growth and development? And that accountability is there. So it's a lot of we are learning and the governance of these things and being willing to be open-minded the different ways in which this can be done. And so you're, you're very careful to say, 
the system of government, you know, we, we don't have to have a particular system of government. Outside parties can't say these are the right institutions. But then a little bit, you know, towards the end of the book, you're arguing for we need to improve quality of elections. We need to strengthen civil society. So it left me thinking, well, where do you stand on the preferable form of government for, for growth and development? Well, it's the thing. I mean, what I don't do is, uh, and I have to be very careful because I think for a few more days I'm a civil servant, what I don't do is this idea, oh, as long as you adopt the Westminster model in our way, everything will be fine for growth and development. You know, there's, there's lots of good reasons why we want to be in favor of, of democracy or, and, and against autocracy. But you have to be willing to be open-minded that there are, for example, more centrally run, more controlled states that have actually been very successful in the field of growth and development. Because I'm talking very much on takeoff development here. I'm not talking about whether they will be as rich as the US or, or Sweden, but, but more of it. In fact, if you look at it, and, and Tim Besley and, and, and a co-author had at one point a really interesting, very simple descriptive statistic, which is basically that democracies they tend to have a lower variance in performance in terms of growth and development than autocracies. You have a much higher variance. But if anyone understands the, how a distribution works, there's some autocracies that have been enormously successful, but has been really so there are lots of autocracies that are really suck as well. So you, you kind of want to be careful with it. But you know, we shouldn't just be naively saying Malawi is a success because they have a form of democracy there. Malawi is not a success in growth and development. And it's one of my most frustrating things, having worked quite a lot in Malawi to actually see how far they are in development. So it is not simply the system of development. But maybe say, I do say at the end of the book, the entry points, when you have a state where the development bargain is not well developed, where the elite bargain is clearly focused much more on redistribution in the form of get my friends some more money or those who vote for me only should get the money. You may want to look within the system. If they are an electoral system, let's try to improve it. If it's a space for civil society, let's try to improve it. If you work in another system, look for your entry point where you actually move this along. Rather than having a doctrinarian view, in every country must do civil society operations because everywhere this will work. You know, just be much more understanding of what's going on in a country and then actually tailor how you do the intervention and use the research that you know about you know, to then actually see, can, can I use this in this particular context? So, so going with the, with the Malawi thread, I'm going to jump to, to Ranul's question. So what do we do about the places left behind? So is there a sense, you know, the Malawis, the DRCs of world aid are sustaining bad development bargains? How do we, I mean, I assume we as the people giving the aid, how do we respond? You know, look at whether it's been given the aid or whether we do it as activists or people concerned here and, or, or even in the country. So, so I'm going to turn this a little bit back first, is that we should start celebrating more those places where there's progress made in the last 30 years. You know? And this is not in a naive way as people in New York often like to do with saying, oh, well, global poverty is falling down, we should celebrate. You know, learn, to learn to highlight those places where the progress is being made. Okay? And so Bangladesh is a good example. In, in the late 1970s, the advisor to Henry Kissinger got a lot of noise at the time by calling it a basket case. In fact, my very first essay on development ever was, is Bangladesh a basket case? And I answered clearly, of course it is, <laughs> in around the early 1980s. Look, countries make progress and they're getting there and we should actually celebrate. So in that sense, there are fewer and fewer places in the world where there are these really bad development bargains. Many more countries have found a way of doing it. And that's a bit what I want to highlight in this, in this book. But then what do I do in Malawi in the DRC? Well, actually try to learn how it happened in other countries. And you work with the grain and you work bit by bit. You find your entry points. And this is in general anything we do in terms of development. Think about where is your entry point? Is there in a country a sensible technocrat who if I support this person, and I'm talking myself now often working with technocrats, if I support this person, this person may be a little bit more influential and to actually shift, shift the dial a little bit more. Is there a department in government? It could be something of the way maybe parliament functions or it may be in the prime minister's office or it may be the auditor general and say, look, there is actually a chance here that we can start working with them. And we're pushing it a bit. Maybe we can do it and saying, look, 
there is not just a private sector that is just connected to government, which unfortunately in these debate development bargains, a lot of the private sector is functioning because it is connected to the government and so on. So it's not the private sectors, but maybe they're firms where you say, well, we can de risk, help to de risk the investments we make in these places. So that these kind of economic operations that are not based simply on connections to government, but general entrepreneurship, get strengthened. So again, you start from good knowledge of what you do and you look for your entry points, your windows opportunities, and that's how you work there. And okay, so if we're getting into how do we implement this, this new framework, so how does an outsider assess if such a bargain is in place? And then I think this relates a bit, this is an anonymous question, but who exactly is the political elite? How do you identify them um, if you're in a country with a lot of, of change in, in uh, political power? So, so, and, and, and arguably, these are, these are, uh, you know, I mean, thank you, these are some of the fundamental questions, okay? <laughs> so, you know, when you, done, when you try to write a book and try to say, okay, can I solve every problem that I have here? I, and the answer is no. There's more books possible. There's more thinking and research possible. But, but let's actually take these, take these in, in, in turn. So, you know, there's a reason why I called this book Gambling on Development. You know, I like to work a lot on this kind of film, but basically, when, when this is happening, it's something with an uncertain outcome. If there was certainty that I had a recipe to actually do exactly how to actually do developing every country with the exact thing, then it would be straightforward and say you get these three things in place and everything everywhere will be fine. No, I don't know what, what, what these things be. So how do I know that everything is right in, right in place? Well, you know, you, you want to judge it partly, but unhelpfully, I would say, by what's then happening next. You know, is progress being made? Is a bit of success being made and so on? But this is where I come back to this other this point that I keep on coming back to, is that actually do you have a system that is willing to learn from how well it's going? And that's actually the main feature. So this is not about dogmatically following a recipe and you'll be successful. And if I identify that little recipe, these three little bits, uh, these variables I can put in a cross-country regression, and then basically every country should sort them out and I'll be fine. No, it's not like this. But you could say, look, I have a list, list of reasonable things that you probably should be trying to do. And if you see, look, is this combination here with the politics and the elites that I'm dealing with here, Am I making enough progress? Is, should I start here? Is this idea of the electricity reform really the one to start? Or why am I going to touch with vested interests that are going to stabilize, destabilize the country so much that chaos will break out? Will I abolish this particular subsidy, this particular subsidy, so that there will be groups in society that can launch a mob and having food riots or energy riots, so that the whole thing needs to go back? That's the kind of thinking, thinking you do. So who is the elite? Well, that's a really good question. And, and arguably, again, look, I'm the white male sitting here. You know, I'm, I, 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 and I will, will explain why I made this comment just now. The elite, of course, I'm calling them those with power and influence at a particular moment in time. Okay? There was a time that I would have thought, you know, um, you know, let me have some revolutionary ideas and overthrow the elites. I think I probably have chosen the career and saying probably given, and I've definitely learned, um, de definitely learned from the Arab Spring, you know, be very careful what you wish for, you know, creating a lot of instability and then see what then happens next. That's a serious gamble that you want to do. But basically the elite is there that you not necessarily like that. But what you try to do all the time, if you have a little bit of chance, whether it's as a donor or as a civil society, how do I strengthen the slightly better, the better um, fruit in the fruit basket. You know, how can I actually get strengthen their position a little bit? How do, and again, it comes back. Pick the people you work with that you actually start shifting the incentives. In several of the chapters, whether I talk about Indonesia or China or in Ghana, it was because at some point the system started to deliver and those who wanted the positive change got stronger. It made some of the more established elite that actually was living purely of the rents and purely of the connections from the state saying, my God, they're getting richer from doing serious things rather than just from connections to the state. And that actually is how change happening. Bangladesh as well, the garment industry played a massive role there in 
actually creating an engine of growth, initially very independent from, from, from politics of the goal. Some people will argue the extent, but it was definitely not as if it was a state-run industry as uh, some people now like to interpret it. They started doing it, employing, contributing a lot to female empowerment and change in society as well. Now everybody wants to be friends with the garment, uh, the garment industrialists, and now they are the elite. Initially, they were the outsiders doing the right things. So you, you need to keep on playing with that and, 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 and doing that. Yes. There it is. Allow me to tell you an anecdote. Why Nations Fail was published around the Arab Spring. And Jim Robinson, who's a good friend of mine, he gave a very generous quote on the back of, of the book. And I remember him excitedly telling about it. My God, were we lucky to publish this book just when the Arab Spring is happening? And he had this very, and I'm sure it wasn't paid for or whatever, he's a very um, honorable man. But he was flown out to all in the Middle East to go and give talks. And he said, this is the moment. And everywhere he was telling, this is the moment where the nation will change and so on. And I thought, you know, that's, that's, yeah, that's quite cool. And, you know, it's an interesting thing. I haven't had a conversation with him. But actually, yeah, he was right. There was a window of opportunity. But, you know, is this the route to total upheaval? You know, some of the consequences were, 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 were a bit were painful as well. I sometimes have quite a lot of sympathy that over the years, when I went to talks, and I worked a lot in China, in Beijing as well, you often would hear some senior minister from China, it's almost a script that all ministers will say, and you hear it now even with the conflict in Ukraine. Peace and stability is the most important thing that China wants to achieve in the world. You know, but unfortunately I have a point. <laughs> if you want development, it's very hard not to have the peace and stability. And we can't quite just hoping for the instability and thinking something will come, uh, get better. I'm not sure I want to take that gamble. I'm not that risk-loving in my gambling. So you, you focus quite a lot on, on spending as a lever. So if we're thinking now about how um, you know, the rest of the world can facilitate these bargains emerging. So you focus a lot on spending. You know, in many countries in the world, it's sort of seen as the correct thing to do with foreign policy that you split aid and diplomacy. But, you know, this, this book made me think, what about high-level diplomacy? Um, you know, and should, so I have in mind that I'm South African, the transition in South Africa. So, you know, probably the main person in that was, Ken, was Kenneth Koenda in Zambia because he hosted Afrikaans businessmen and the ANC in exile and he got them talking and he was the only person who could do that. So I guess, you know, how do you see those, those two levers working together? Are they different parties, the same party? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm going to first try to contradict you and to, to, to make sure that you don't get the wrong impression of the book. 80% of the book is not about spending, and I don't talk about aid, because actually I really wanted the book, uh, writing a book where actually in most of the parts when I talk about the countries, the outside is the aid environment. It's tiny. The role of them is tiny. At best, it's, um, you know, um, I see Paul Collier sitting here, and, and, and he used to talk a lot about agencies of restraint. So having the World Bank and the IMF to be a bit of an agency of restraint, give, a, give an excuse to blame someone if you're in, in your actions where you actually need to do some painful reforms. You know, I see roles like that, you know, but I want countries to really own them, not just in the jargonic, jargonistic way as we often talk about it. No, they have to be in charge of their own development. And aid these days is a tiny fraction of financial flows to these places. So we should never overstate. It's very tempting to do it. And of course, the job I was having in different and so on, it's very dangerous to do that. In fact, countries themselves will need to develop and they will need to find their politics. They need to find their economic, their economic deal and the political deal to actually do that. But it's true in the final part to talk about what can outsiders do. And the reason why I talk about aid is that, first of all, I think I know a bit more about it. I seem to have been cutting the aid budget and all kinds of stuff in decent times and all kinds of awful things to do. Um, but I know a bit about it, what can be done. And in fact, I hope you would read the third part of the book also as a critique of how aid is done at the moment. And I think it's really, not necessarily in the UK or not, that's not a comment I want to make, but globally, the way we look at it, it doesn't really make sense. However, what does other ways of doing it? I was careful not to say Diplomacy, you know, and, and now, you know, I work in, <laughs> I, I was working for now for the last 18 months in a foreign and commonwealth and government office. So there's all the foreign policy there. You know, I want to be a bit self-conscious here. 
You know, it's not the UK diplomats who are going to, going to change Malawi. And if they try to do it, it's definitely going to go wrong. And you need to just be self-aware of where you have. And it's a bit about the legitimacy that you have. Now, there are sometimes windows of opportunities. You know, diplomats from the UK played a huge role in finding a settlement in Zimbabwe, the Lancaster House thing. And that's, of course, the kind of thing. But it again comes about two things. Do you have the window of opportunity to do it? And secondly, can you do with diplomacy from, and I'm now talking about from richer countries, do you have the legitimacy to do it? And you have to ask yourself about legitimacy and not just lecturing these countries what to do. But where it then comes further is again, you know, when some countries are getting the signs that they're actually serious about their development, you know, then support them, help them, give them voice internationally, talk them up that they're actually doing sensible things, help them to get the development finance they need, and so on. That, I think, is totally legitimate on, on, on the diplomats. But, but it is a bit to do with the, you know, the lecturing countries that need to sort out their lead bargain, their politics, from a foreign office in the UK or from the European Union. Mm, this is not the time and age anymore to do these things. So, but you can, if you can support them, whatever you can do, you can do it. Maybe a final point. There are definitely a lot of things that we can do, and it's not quite diplomacy, but it's also not aid, that actually making good developed markets is possible. And so in the book I talk about, let me pick out one thing, you know, illicit finance. No, I'm not one of these people who talk about illicit finance because it's really a disgrace that no taxes have been paid and therefore the money is in Switzerland. To be honest, that's not where I would start because I'm not that interested when, when I was working on, on the DRC to get Kabila far more money. I have very little confidence that if Kabila had had more money in his own bank account in the treasury, that much more good things would have been done about it. The problem with illicit finance is it actually feeds terrible elite parking. And it's actually to do with the politics. It creates terrible politics. You know, a colleague here at Oxford, Ricardo Suarez de Oliveira, is writing a book also on it. But they're political lens. And we need to just understand that's one of the big reasons why we should try to find a lot to do with illicit finance, because it helps really odious regimes in power, because they can exploit this, pay for politics in a very terrible way, and keep it going. So I think I, I can't see who this the anonymous person is, but this this top question. So we've got a, a few actually here. You know, it, we're not saying uh, you know if we we need to act necessarily, but like diagnostically, why do some why do development bargains emerge in some places and not and not others? And then also Mui's question: Are there institutional prerequisites before uh, we get these elite yeah. bargains? So 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 let me take the last one is that, you know, again, I'm not going to have the smallest or the minimum amount that you want to have. You know, I'm, in the framework I use uh, of elite bargains, actually, you know, I borrowed this from Douglas North and, and Wallace and Meingast in their book on violence and, uh, and social order, where it basically say, you know, it's a useful thing to think of a state. Why do state, why do historically states emerge? As a way to actually overcome, you know, a kind of situation where each group or village or whatever would be fighting with each other and to try to get the spoils of the resources in the country. And they say, well, it's probably better to have a deal with each other so that we actually stop the violence and maybe call, like Max Weber would call, a, a form of monopoly of violence that you actually begin, begin to get it. So, so, the, the, so, so the minimal amount for development bargain, I would definitely say, you'll need peace and stability. It doesn't have to be perfect but you need some form of peace and stability. Just you can't, you can't go beyond that. It's also in the book why actually I talk quite a lot about places like Afghanistan, but also places like Somaliland, which actually have managed to get within their strange context quite a successful, stable, peaceful state within the context of a very unstable um, Somalia as a whole. So you know you get these places that actually can find that first prerequisite of, of, of getting it. Um, and remind me what the other question was. Oh, how they come about, yeah. development markets. Well, so your minimal amount already, is, it's almost what I said, is that you want to, in, in any case, before you can go to a development bargain, probably an elite bargain that creates some stability in the context. That's the minimum. So you have some form of political settlement that is already some, some stability. Now, it's then very interesting to see the countries that achieved it 
And if you then take some of the countries, like, you know, how do we interpret China, what happened in 1979? Well, actually, one way of interpreting China is that it came out of a terrible, turbulent time with the Cultural Revolution. And then with Mao, Mao's death, but then the Gang of Four, this was a country essentially in civil war. This was a country that actually was risking during the, with the, with the Gang of Four before 1979, before Deng Xiaoping came, came to power, risking a lot. So you actually got, because of as a way of getting out of conflict, but at the same time, almost trying to make sure that regime tries to survive, that actually you look for a way of getting legitimacy with your population again. And the way I would interpret what Deng Xiaoping did, the governance reforms he did, is that actually it included getting legitimacy from the population through growth and development. You know, and think of it, you know, a Marxist regime that doesn't really believe in the afterlife, you know, there's the only legitimacy we'll have is, is, is the daily bread and the, and the kind of thing. So that was the minimal amount that had to be done. And I think that's a powerful thing. If you think of Bangladesh, it came out of a dreadful civil war and a period of huge instability uh, after 1972, 1973. And then you basically, you know, you, you had a turbulent period in the 1970s. It was actually pretty unstable, where actually somehow a consensus gets forced. You get in Ghana after military regime, you know, where people say, look, military, are we really trusting that they will not take power back? That actually an elite bargain amongst politics actually was gotten to actually say, look, let's have rules of the game that we actually create enough stability that we don't give an excuse for going further. So, so you get these kind of moments. Now, it doesn't mean that every conflict or every period of instability leads to a development bargain, but it is a window of opportunity. And it's actually how they emerge is then it's probably, it's never just one leader, it's usually different people in politics and in business, maybe in the military as well, that actually make a choice, a gamble. Because in the short run, this doesn't necessarily pay off, but actually work slowly and actually see whether how, how, we, how we can progress it. And getting that shared commitment and saying, let's actually see where this leads us, but let's, let's keep it together for now and not, let's not, let it not implode immediately. So I uh, just lost, ah, there. So there was a latest one that came up. It was again an anonymous one. Yes. So should, you know, so, so should development efforts by outsiders be focused on working with the elite and in their interests only, or are there contexts where bottom-up coalitions could work better? So, so, no, it's a good question. And so, you know, you, I use the word elite not in a normative sense that I love elites or something but are more in a positive sense, in a positive descriptive sense, in actually those people with power and influence, those people that make it happen. Now, an obvious thing that you immediately said is, and in fact, you gave the example already that was in the book, that within context, if you have the chance, you know, to get civil society to become more powerful, actually they become part of the influence and they make that coalition broader. And of course, you know, I'm all for inclusivity, but I didn't want to simply say, oh, you have to have that perfectly sorted before any growth and development takes place. It's again, not that kind of thing like, we need to first create Sweden and then we'll start development. You know, this kind of the perfect equal, gender equal, everything society and then we'll start development. No, that's not how it works. It is quite an imperfect places that will start. I, so I'm not trying to legitimize elites, but funnily enough, I don't mind elites trying to legitimize themselves through growth and development. And I think through results and outcomes. And so this is not me trying to say now you're legitimate, but actually more putting the challenge to them. You say, you know, give us more, give us more development, give us more progress in society, make it a more prosperous society and, and, and make sure it's inclusive and so on. And that's actually, I think, where, 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 where we, would, we would get at. So, Archita, are you here? Yeah. Can you ask your question? Yeah, I mean, this is something we've talked about before as well with Stefan, but I was interested to uh, know his views on how the international development communities focus on, you know, evidence-based policy and how that implicates um, elite bargains. Can they only work when elite bargains are conducive? Or yeah. Thank you, Achita. That's an excellent question. And, you know, look, so, so th this is where, you know, like um, someone who does too many things, you know, you might... In my research work, I often do RCTs and so on and say, you know, this is like miles away from any of that kind of research, you know. Um, so so, the, so the, the thing that I want to 
emphasize here is that, um, you know, a whole technocratic approach to development, you know, where you say, look, we give a lot of technical advice, you give a lot of, uh, of advice of how to get things done and so on within, within uh, things or what, what to do and so on. You know, it has its role. In fact, I would say there's an increasing number of countries where this is extremely useful now, because actually you have more and more countries that actually seem to evolve more towards more and more development back. But what you shouldn't have the naivety to saying, and this is where I had a conversation with Archita before, that in UP and Bihar, you will, in India, let's call them not very well-run states in India, and that's a very nice way of describing them, um, that you, you, you actually all, oh, by actually having a little technical twist, will suddenly get development going. No. If the, the, the political bargain, elite bargain is such that the only thing that, that the elite is doing is just keeping themselves in power, either it's lining their pockets or lining those who keep them in power, the pockets of those in power, and just only giving jobs to people that are never qualified, filling the civil service with only their friends and family, you know, all the kinds of things that we know in clientelist or patronage-based politics. So then, then I say, look, just be very careful. Maybe do then research of how can I shift the incentives in a system like that. But don't think that simply saying, if I get a slightly better textbook, or maybe not a textbook, but another tool in education, suddenly learning will emerge. That's clearly not how you're going to get change in societies like that. But the evidence-based framework, you know, there is a role for te te technocracy. In fact, this is the other part, and I write quite a lot about in the book, is that most of these success stories of countries that achieved it, they're well-identifiable technocrats that get them together. You know, we can name them in Indonesia, and in fact, in recent times, the finance ministry, Mulyan Indirati, he's essential to keep the trajectory going. We know that in Tanzania, Ben Ondulu, former uh, Central Bank government who unfortunately passed away not so long ago, was actually a key technocrat who knew the politics and actually kept it together. Uh, we had it in Ethiopia, Nuai Gebreab, who was the advisor to the prime minister, but a technocrat and a key bit. And in fact, this is what I've always enjoyed doing, is to work with these people because they actually understand what is possible in their places. And this is that actually, uh, but they understand how to get things done in their context, rather naively writing a little paper. This is what now Ethiopia, Ghana, or Tanzania, or Bihar needs to do, because this has now, there's money being left on the table because the results are not getting it. So you have to be willing to be smart around politics and how you engage with it. But I mean, just to, just to push you a little bit on that question, because I think a little bit where Archita is going, there's this whole other sort of development perspective that you funded, funded quite a lot of, where you know, this is Esther Duflo and the economist as plumber. It's like, you know, the outside world and technical expertise needs to really get into the detailed technocratic business of these, these countries. And it sounds like you're saying, no, we actually need to be stepping quite back quite a lot. We don't, we don't necessarily, you know, just because we generate evidence in one place, that's not almost always not going to be the best thing to do in another context. So is the economist as plumber, is the, you know, is that perspective dead? You know, let's not... There's, there's reasonably good reasons why she got a Nobel Prize, okay? So, uh, <laughs> but, so but what I'm writing is not trying to be against this, and it would be so simplistic to try to say, understand what the place of that is. So understand that, first of all, there's a lot of places where governments are quite committed to do it, and they would like to actually really literally improve the learning in their schools, and they're willing to let you get into under the skin of what's happening there and actually try to improve it. You know, as a civil servant in London, when working on UK things, of course you want to use that kind of stuff because that's quite important and you want to do it. But what I'm kind of saying is that whether it's in the UK or everywhere, you need to understand the political economy as well because certain things are not happening in, in, in certain places, not simply because somehow we haven't quite had the, the strong enough evidence that there is actually, if we properly do the experiment, there is a 5% return to that particular investment. That's not really why all kinds of sensible things uh, don't happen. And so, so yeah, so, so we funded it because, first of all, as a knowledge tool, knowing whether if you do this or that, 
and though we improve something by it, it's useful knowledge. But don't overstate that the impact you can have simply by doing this, you know? And this is the other part. I make a big plea that if you want to be sensible and work sensibly in a country, try to understand the big picture of that country as well. You know, one little RCT on one particular area doesn't make change, but it can maybe inform in one day the kind of things that can happen once we have these change processes. And so, yeah, pick, pick, pick it a bit, bit much better. And am I, am I saying that the industry itself is wrong? When it overstates its influence, when it overstates its relevance for development and as a big thing we want to achieve, then it actually, it, it's wrong. But, you know, let researchers do what researchers do, and I'm definitely much more tolerant than you want me to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, is Z Zilli here? Yes, go ahead. To talk about the example of China. So I was wondering that what could be the incentives for the elites to really to pursue a bargain for development rather than to pursue their self-interest? Because you talk about China, you said that at that time there was a, you know, I would say a crisis of uh, legitimacy. So I, I was wondering, is that is that needed to happen in order to create a sort of, as you said, a window for opportunity to, to make it happen? I, I, I have, yeah, that's an excellent question. And thank you for actually confirming also the way I would interpret the price of legitimacy that existed in 1979 and so on. So it's one example what, what it could be. Of course, there are examples where actually uh, window of opportunities present themselves in different ways. Um, you know, uh, and, um, and, and it's the craftsmanship of individuals and groups of people that then becomes important. OK, so so it, it doesn't come out of necessarily a crisis, but I can't deny that when people are comfortable in power, it's sometimes very hard to shift these incentives to just to do what they're doing. And, you know, the, the simplest example is that all of we know we often talk about resource uh, resource curves and whatever these things is. But it's a very simple thing. If you have a lot of natural resources. There's very little incentive for you to make your economy grow in the hard way because you have the money there. I mean, you know, and then you divide amongst those with power and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's you can handle that, you know, and it's a really tough thing to actually sometimes shift it. So there are places that actually shift this. And, you know, I'm OK, so I'm, I'm, I haven't written about Tanzania in my chapter. I'm actually getting quite excited again about Tanzania. They went to the period that uh, our dear friend Ben Ondulu was there working, there was actually a, a really first step of a real consolidation of stability. And he, as central bank governor, of course, macroeconomic stability is a big part of it. And we're talking about, you know, about 10 years, 12 years ago. And there was a real stability. You've got a real sense this is a long period of stability. They got some natural resources that were growing. Of course, you had a little bit of a strange period then, in the last few years, where President Magafuli came to power. And, you know, um, I remember in one of my early uh, reports inside Diffit, I called him the broomstick. Actually, he got the name the bulldozer, so he had a slightly slightly more direct uh, form that he then acquired. And he was trying to, and I was told, you know, he tries to actually change the country, but in such a heavy-handed way, it can't be happening. But actually, corruption went down, and Tanzania results in education actually improved. And I think now with the current presidency, with all the noises they make, I kind of think you know, they take their opportunity. You know, they're not doing badly. They're macroeconomically don't come out to back the out of this crisis. So I'm kind of hopeful. So it doesn't have to come out of a huge crisis of legitimacy. It can be because actually those people with power and influence, in this case, the party people of the CCM, there's, some, there's enough reasonable people there now, unlike maybe at some point in economic policy. So it can happen. I don't know. I'm not going to put any money that they're the, going to be the success uh, there, you know. I, you know, I'm not going to be like the advisors to Henry Kissinger, that that's a basket case of success, although in the book maybe I give an allusion to it uh, there. But, but, you know, there will be places. And I think in Africa especially, there are going to be countries that are going to surprise us because I do think they're getting together. So it's not just that. It can, of course, play a big, big role. And often we say this at the moment, what better window of opportunity for some places coming out of COVID and coming out of crisis to actually see it? Of course, it's also a really difficult time to do it, and the global environment is really difficult. But there will be some places. Yeah. 
I guess, I mean, I'm just building on this uh, anonymous question here. Can you, can you um, give it, so you've given us some examples of events that uh, foster this new development bargain in a particular place. So you know, we have the crisis of legitimacy example, or the kind of collapse example. Are there other things that can help to foster those bargains? So, 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 so yeah, so actually there are things in the economy that actually can help to do, get this done. And, and, and I'll go back to, for a moment, the example of Bangladesh, but it, it played a role in, in, in Vietnam. Um, it plays a role in, in other places as well, where um, it played definitely a role in Indonesia. Um, and it's actually in the following way, is that um, there are particular types of sectors in the economy that actually need a bit of a longer horizon to be successful. They're natural resources. As Michael Wong famously said about diamonds, you only need a gun and a mobile phone, and that's about all you need to be a diamond, uh, run a diamond mine. Um, and and basically, she meant you could just have a little plane flying in. You could, and you only need it for a few months, and you can be a billionaire. Um, if you want to be successful in manufacturing, it will take you five or ten years to actually build up that capability. Now, what can strengthen development bargaining? is actually success in things that are more difficult in the economy, but then begin to generate return. And actually that's where the, where the example comes from Bangladesh again. They were lucky to be able to start with garments early on, but actually it became quite successful and it actually generated. And in fact, it meant that macroeconomically, you wanted to make sure that you kept, be, became open to the world, that you actually have a, a fairly well-managed macroeconomy because otherwise garments would have collapsed. So the more that they slowly got the political influence for something that needed to be exported, the stronger the elite bargain to make sure we stay strong in exporting. And so these are things, you know, exporting is a great way to strengthen development bargains or trying to export because the world is your judge whether you actually produce something good. It's not simply the, 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 the awful stuff that you may get at home because nobody will buy your stuff at home. No, any, any firm that tries to export needs to have global norms, has to be good, has to be productive, has to be efficient. And that actually helps you then because these are difficult things to actually strengthen the political bargain in favor of these kinds of things. So the book is full of bits of examples like that and you can actually do this and it's, I think people often say in the World Bank, oh, well, the economy should be open. I think the most important part why sometimes some of these open economies, these export-oriented economies, they're successful is because it puts such an agency of restraint on domestic politics that you couldn't screw up your macroeconomy. And I mean, this is a really interesting one. So I've got another question here. How would government or leaders of a country go about fostering such a bargain? So you've said, and, and this is not to be prescriptive or say this is what they ought to do, but across the different cases that you've that you've seen. So you know, the one is build on your examples of success and make sure they keep going. But you know, can you are there other cases or or uh, things like that where governments have done well to kind of build the elite bargain gradually over yeah. time. So, so look, let me, and, and so I talk quite a bit about it, why, why I begin to be um, quite, quite optimistic about, um, for example, Kenya, a place that I even used to be very optimistic about. And, and, and one of the reasons why, why I wasn't very optimistic about Kenya is that because unlike Tanzania, it has played, and it's well documented, played from beginning, from, from a time of independence, a really strong ethnic card. And in fact, you have a huge division between those around the Kikuyu and those around Nandaluo um, in the west of the country. And so ethnic politics has dominated politics in Kenya quite strongly over, over the decades. And so we, you know, if we think of our collective memory, every time there's elections, everybody's now worried because we know in 2007, I think it was, there was really extreme rioting and lots of people got killed and lots of instability for months and really kind of bordering on genocidal behavior taking place and, you know, International Court of Justice had to come in and indicting senior political leaders. So you really have this thing. Now, why do I then become a little bit more positive? Actually, the main one, the main way is um, over time, they have been trying to make a deal amongst these big political factions that represent ethnic politics with a constitutional reform, 
So actually, we move one big driver of uh, the, the ethnic violence, i.e. that politicians really love to exploit it. This is a very centralized political system. All the power is in the presidency, and if you control the central state, you control everything. It's a pretty corrupt state as well. So basically, the fight and the politicians use the ethnic card trying to, try to capture, the, capture the center, and then the winner takes all. Actually, they've done a reform, which is decentralization, where it's actually not anymore winner takes all, where actually if you don't win the capital, you may win the province and you may win the governorship. Okay, it's quite a corrupt place. But actually, despite that corruption, I think actually it's a smart way. You know, you almost say you've decentralized the corruption actually as a way to get a much more stable political system now. Meanwhile, by decentralizing, governors now need to apparently be elected based on platforms of outcomes, of results. So politics is brought a bit closer to people. It's been quite successful there. I'm not saying decentralization always works, but it actually is quite interesting. And so I hear now of governors of different uh, provinces in, in Kenya that actually are very outcome oriented and basically run elections based on, I want to deliver this for you, rather than I'm a Luo, therefore you should vote for me. And I think you know, that's why I get so Kenya is a high potential country, but you get somehow a move in the elite park and actually beyond amongst themselves that they start uh, negotiating, negotiating that. And in the process, funnily enough, and I saw another question clearly slightly hostile coming there and saying, you know, um, who are the, the gambled and the non gambled, who are the elite and the, you know, I wish it was totally inclusive. You know, this is not that I'm trying to justify it, I'm trying to be describing how I think it's actually happening rather than justifying it. But then you see in Kenya, by opening it up and more politics away from ethnicity, I get a bit hope, more hopeful of politics there that can become more results-based, open, different type of people can get into politics and you begin so. So I would say this is actually quite good and, and, and quite an, an important thing. So I guess just, just the last before we close, do you, you know, so, so you're a government and you're trying to form this elite bargain. What do you do with the real road blockers? So I have in mind unions in South Africa, Mexico, you know, there, there are lots of places, for example, where um, there's, there's been a big push towards labor market reform, but the unions are a big part of the elite bargain, have been for a long time, and they, they block the extent to which reform can occur. France is the same. What do you do with that blocker? So, so what you do is that, you know, it, it comes back to maybe some of the earlier questions and, you know, and you mentioned it, you know, take, take the South African example, you know, you have enormous time for an enormous uh, appreciation and respect for one of my heroes, Nelson Mandela. But actually, you know, you could say that at the time of the end of apartheid, he managed to get an elite bargain for peace and stability. The country didn't explode. But somehow or another, that elite bargain never really managed to get fully developmental because there were all these different blockers, whether it's the unions or whether it's big capital in different places. But if you, you know well enough, if you want to change South Africa, you know, it's, you, you, um, you know, I probably would still be one of the people who would say, find ways of working with the grain and try to actually see over time that actually it is not in the union's interest to block the process, the progress. So that actually, because, you know, these powerful blocks, you can't just immediately remove them. And I, you know, um, I'm not sure, you know, the, an Iron Spring example is there, you know, the big shock therapy, some people in South Africa or in other countries would argue for it, I'm probably not arguing for it. But what you can find this way, how do I actually make sure the unions are not a big box? Now, the interesting thing could be, is not to try to reduce the power of the unions, you know, maybe someone will say that becomes necessary, I'm not the one that will say that. But you could say, actually, maybe we'll start supporting parts of economic progress and growth in the country, where we don't start from heavily unionized, but actually things that are generally in comparative advantage of South Africa, and not necessarily some of the things that the unions are very powerful in some of the factories, and actually generally saying, and we're actually going to get growth where actually uh, wages are increases, growth is beginning to do, so that they actually can see, well, actually, maybe this way of working with capital as a union is maybe a slightly better way of doing it. And maybe both will see sense to actually have a different way of working. Because I think, say, in South Africa and in many countries, it's not just, say, the union is the blockers. I would say it often is a coalition of capital and unions. 
sitting in sectors that probably are incumbent and don't want their privileges in the economy to disappear. So that's again, the garment industry in Bangladesh is this nice example. They were not incumbents, they were allowed to grow. But actually, funnily enough, actually, if we now look at Bangladeshi politics, they may become the incumbents now and start blocking further reform. That's the way it's much more dynamic. But find these ways of, of progressing. And that's how I would do it. So I think we get a, a message of, of small, gradual progress, finding windows of opportunity, creating successes, and then, then building on them. Yes, but always make sure you understand what's going on in the place and have a clear political nows for the details of what's going on. Because if you don't understand that, you're going to get the wrong windows of opportunities and nothing will happen. There we go. So I think we will close on that. Thank you all so much for, for joining us. Um, you can um, find uh, Stefan outside. Um, so he, he's going to be around. Please join us for a drink um, afterwards out in the lobby. Um, you can follow the book's progress on Twitter. There's going to be launches all over the place. Um, so there's going to be one at the uh, Oxford Martin School next week, I think still in Oxford, um, and then various ones that are, are going to be hybrid and streamed, streamed online if you would like to see that. The book is also on sale um, outside. Uh, so if you go up to, towards the sort of right-hand side, um, you can pick up a copy there. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.